good tidings, fellow weebs. Uh, fall 2021 has actually been like the first season where I've been on the ball and uh, watching a bunch of seasonal shows. I've got 10. So uh, as I keep track of everything, I actually kind of want to just go over them briefly. So I've decided to kind of revive this channel and uh, just do a little seasonal anime roundup. I'll be doing some other videos down the line, but for now, I just want to quickly just talk about all the shows I watched this season and uh, we'll just kind of give you my thoughts on them and if they're worth it, checking out later, uh, now that it's not fall 2021 anymore. I'm also wearing this bucket hat because uh, my mom got it for me for Christmas and uh, you could say I've taken a shine to it. Anyway, uh, so with that out of the way, uh, I'm just going to be going over all 10 shows I watched this season. Uh, no Demon Slayer. We're not, we're not talking about Demon Slayer. Um, I, it's, it's, it's fucking Demon Slayer, alright? It's good. Sorry, pal, who is not present in this season at all. He's doing his best, though, isn't he? So I'll pretty much just be talking my thoughts on each show. I won't be, like, reviewing it properly. I'll just be like, here's my thoughts. I'm assuming you've already watched the things that I'm talking about. So if you haven't, then you can go watch them, or you can decide based on my thoughts if you want to watch it. Um, I will be spoiling some of them. For the most part, I'm trying to keep it pretty general, so take that however you want to. First of all, Tact OP Destiny. So this one was kind of on everyone's radar this season because it's an animated collab uh, based on a video game uh, from two really big animation studios, those being Mappa and Madhouse. So needless to say, visuals in this show are incredible. Uh, it doesn't really miss a beat. The animation is fucking stunning. It's, uh, it is generally just has absolutely gorgeous visuals. Landscapes are awesome. Just over, even like, even character design is just completely on point. There's a lot of really good designs for the music arts. Um, Titan, Hell, and Heaven come to mind. But the problem is, it's based on a video game. So there's no plot. The plot of the show is what would happen if I was drunk at 3 a.m. and someone came up to me at a Waffle House and said, I'll pay you $12 to write a story based on this premise I came up with. People have tried to clarify what it's actually about based on the video game, but really I don't think it helps. The whole point of it was to like eliminate the threat of the D2s, right? The things that don't like the music, so they're using the music to fight the D2s and completely eliminate the threat. That's the goal. Of course, since it's kind of like a prequel to a video game, I guess you can't really completely eliminate the threat, but regardless, because of that, the ending of the show feels like a letdown. Because the whole point was building up to eliminate the threat of the D2s from civilization and save music, but music was not saved, and a destiny is still dead. This show is all over the place. I really don't know what to tell you. This might be the first time a character has made me actively ask the question, is there a such thing as too edgy? Tact. All he does is play piano and complain. His backstory with Kazette is actually quite sweet. Um, and uh, the loss of his father contributes a lot to his what little character he has, but it's really hard to get on board with him as the protagonist because he's just not honest at all. His, his goal is admirable, right? He wants to save music and he's really good at the piano and he has his father's charm or whatever. Also, on talk of Anna, who is this show's sweetheart, Destiny passes her music art powers to Anna and then dies. And I read a tweet that was like, so the anime takes place like X amount of years before the video game, and then in the video game, when it starts, you wake up from Tax Coma, who hasn't aged because he's been preserved in a magic tank, or a tank of science. Anna now has Destiny's powers, and she also hasn't aged because of science. So, now they get to fight together, and that's the video game. Because the D2s are still around. So what was the point of, of anything? This show can totally be enjoyed solely based off its visuals. Uh, even character designs can contribute to that. The music in this is great too. Um, the opening I think was written by Mafu Mafu, so it was really not playing around. That being said, the plot left something to be desired. Um, 
the, the premise is good, right? Like, you know, using music to fight, you'd think that hit well with me, but I just, I don't, I didn't really care that much. But a lot of the action sequences were really fucking good. So it was just missing, like, a good story. And if it had that, it would have been sold. I'm calling this one Nut and Go. So Mushoku Tensei Part 2 happened this season, and it was a bit of a roller coaster. It was a little all over the place. If I've learned anything from Mushoku Tensei Part 1, it's that it has no problem uprooting everything you know and throwing the characters into a completely different situation. And that kind of makes it unique and interesting, but it also confuses me. The first episode of Part 2, Rudy gets a demon eye from a small girl, and then like three episodes later, he's been captured by forest people. Three episodes after that, he's seen his dad again, and is fighting to get his little sister to like him. Then he fight tries to get his other sister to like him, because he's kind of a weird guy. And then like three episodes after that, he gets owned by some dragon guy. And uh, and then like after that, like Rudy and Eris go at it, and then done. Like, overall, I do like the idea of, like, being reincarnated from birth. I think there's a lot of merit to it. And I think it can add to a character, and it definitely does in Rudy's case. It makes him very interesting. Um, it's, it's kind of weird to deal with him going back and forth between fat loser nerd and handsome lad, but you kind of get used to it. Although it does feel a little bit like their quest to return was in vain from the start, because that teleportation... Uh, Catalysm or whatever. Uh, I think it's fair to assume it fucked up the whole place. So I don't know why they were trying to return anyway and expect everything to just be fine. I mean, maybe they thought their family would still be there, but he found Paul in some random place. Is that is still yet to be found? Like overall, it feels like things just move too quickly from one to another. That I just lack the general brain power to comprehend the show and like its themes. I was kind of on board with, with Rudy, Eris, and Ruiger just kind of vibing and going around like fighting people every so often. But now it's changing really quickly and it happens like that. Overall I think Mushogo Tensei has a great sense of world building, so if you can get into that, you probably love this shit. Banished from the hero's party, I decided to live a quiet life in the countryside. What? So light novel titles have been getting more ridiculous by the day, and this is no exception. But I do think the actual premise is quite fun. It works well for the show. It sets up a really nice world for the characters to kind of operate in. The idea of the blessings kind of inherently gives a sense of like, maybe something's awry. Because like literally everyone who was born into this world has like a role forced upon them by God. And you're like, immediately, that's fucky. I also quite like the dynamic of the main character being the older brother of the hero, um, and the hero being the young girl, who is ridiculously strong, comically so. This show also continues a trend that has been popping up here and there recently in anime, and that is uh, composed, capable, smart guy with uh, kind of airheaded but hard-hitting, uh, hot girl. I mean, look no further than Akira and Yuri. Uh, good show, by the way. It's nothing to write home about, but it's fun. Although one question to raise between Red and Reed is, are they too much? Right, because this almost seemed like an experiment. These two are on top of each other like 24-7. It's almost overbearing, although it's so wholesome that she kind of can't help but get on board with it. What's weird is that in the light novels, it's not actually so omnipresent. There's a much more controlled and reasonable amount of affection between them. Um, I haven't read very far. I'm not up to where the anime finishes, but um, even in just the first volume, they're, they're not even close to on top of each other the amount of, that they are in the anime. So it's, it's very strange that they did that for the adaptation. It, it, it almost gets to the point where it's too much because they're trying to tell the story like, about, you know, the demon lord and Ruti feeling lonely and the drugs or whatever that are going around, but, um, then there's also just, then Red and Reed just fucking, almost fucking, like, 24-7. Like, penis be that close. It's just, he's just, he's just waiting for an opportunity to, <laughs> like I said, they're extremely wholesome. 
so it's kind of hard not to get on board with their cute little charade, but it does become a little much. Like, you, you gotta ask, like, at what point does it become too much? This is another one of those light novels that obviously plans to run for quite a while. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle that don't really fit into place yet, because we're only 13 episodes into this show. I don't know if it'll get a season two, but it feels like there's this big world that they're trying to establish, and there's not enough pieces of the puzzle there to figure everything out or for anything to really make sense. There's too much missing right now. That even though the show has ended, obviously the story hasn't concluded, but we're kind of left like, run that by me again. Overall, this show is definitely enjoyable. I have ice in my mouth. This show is definitely enjoyable, um, especially if you can get into the world. Like Mushoku Tensei, it, it has a very solid sense of world building. There's a lot to kind of sink your teeth into, but in the end, I think it's probably a light novel seller, and it worked. The Fruit of Evolution, before I knew it, my life had it made. This show is peak ridiculous. I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just, nothing is off limits. Anything can turn into a hot girl. You look away for one second and a fucking leaf on the tree has transformed into a girl with huge tits. I'm serious. Nothing is off limits. A gorilla and a donkey both turn into a hot girl. What are you supposed to do? Like I said, this is peak ridiculous. It rides the line nicely. So if you like your shows ridiculous, like I do, then you'll probably love this. Not for its characters or for its story. In fact, the story is rather mediocre, but it's just so stupid that I can't help but love it. Like I said, there's nothing to write home about in this show, but but mad props to the guy who like stood atop the, the walls of the city, faced down like 5,000 monsters or whatever it was, and was like, I will defeat all of you with the power of my massive cock, and just gets his dick out, and the whole harem is like, wow. Impressive. <laughs> that was good. One day, I'm gonna do, do, do. I don't know. Let's talk selection project. This show is dreadfully cute. Like every time I watch it, I get a cavity. And whoever came up with the name QT for their idol group needs a raise. I'm not kidding. That shit is so good. That is so clever. I'm not big on idol shows. Something drew me in about this one. It definitely has a charm to it, and seeing all of the nine main girls and how they all come from very distinct and different backgrounds, but they all, like, are able to work so well together and come together for their common purpose with, of dancing around and singing on stage, it, it's quite adorable, and it makes you really want to root for them. I do think that some of the drama points in the show are stupid. The final one being the main one that comes to mind. At the very end, Susan A. and Reyna are like stuck in the hospital because Susan A like overworked herself and they're trying to give their debut performance as cutie but Susan A is just like dead and they're worried that she's gonna like die or something like the way they speak it like sounds like she's gonna die but she's really just collapsed because she's tired and they're like oh no the selection project is on TV now we gotta get back and they, then like you know they, like, she has a fever dream and all as well. The story of uh, Akari Amasawa, I believe the, her name is, um, is incredibly predictable, but it still hits. Uh, it's very sweet. Like, you could probably realize from the first or second episode that when Akari died, her heart was transplanted into Suzume. It's not rocket science, but it's still very cute. Like, it's definitely sad, but at the same time, like, a lot of organ donor stories just tend to like hit because it is one of like the most selfless things that people can do right in case an accident happens they can save someone with with a part of them that they no longer have any use for because they're dead and susan a being all embarrassed about her uh her little scar it's a bit weird but you know like there's definitely she was all worried because, oh no, I have to wear a bikini, it's gonna show my scar. You could definitely get swimsuits that have covered this part. You don't need, you didn't need a Mako to make one for you. The last thing to say, only one yell. That's it. Applause. Best ending of the year? Definitely of the season. Only one yell is absolutely one of those songs that is like, it forces you to smile. 
like, no matter what state of mind I'm in at any given point, I listen to only one yell and I'm like, it's gonna make me smile. Regardless. Like, in the context of the actual show, it's kind of like, you know, what are the most naturally gifted idols the world has ever seen who died in an accident, in a tragic accident, left this behind as, like, her most well-known song. And, uh, them, like, using it to audition for the selection project is is really quite nice. This song is just so good. I It was stuck in my head for a long time when I first heard it. Like, again, I'm not big on idol shows, but something about Selection Project drew me in. It's very, very cute. Mieteko chan is kind of boring. I know a lot of people were into this one, uh, and I can kind of see why. And it was definitely disturbing. A lot of the designs for the creatures were, in fact, very disturbing. And I did not like seeing them. I, I was very successfully creeped out. In the show description, like, on the back of the box, they're like, Miko sees all these creepy things, but she has to try to ignore them so she doesn't seem like a weirdo. So if the whole point is for her to just try to ignore the things she sees, and she's aware that they can't physically interact with her, what is the point? Around the middle of this show, I found it really hard to get through some of these episodes because they were just so boring. In addition to that, because she ignores the things, but she, like, still pays attention to them, it makes a lot of her exchanges with, like, Hannah really awkward to watch from our point of view because she's, like, outwardly ignoring Hannah and is, like, giving this thing the death stare. But she knows that she can't interact with it and it can't interact with her. Physically, anyway. But she still is, like, <laughs> I mean, I would be too, but it's still weird. So a lot of those exchanges were hard to watch. Uh, Hannah also leaves something to be desired. In fact, she leaves everything to be desired. Hannah as a character functions nicely as a counterpoint to Miko, if nothing else. But the depth of her character goes about as far as the dimensions of the butt-shaped meat buns she eats all the time. The only thing she ever says is like, Let's go get meat buns! Oh, shitty die food! <laughs> I'm so hungry! If I have to fucking see her get those fucking meat buns one more time, I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot! In addition to that, there are too many unanswered questions. Why does Hannah have a powerful aura? Why can Miko see things in the first place? How do beings end up on that plane of reality? Are, they, are these questions answered in the manga? Because I'm not reading this manga. I think overall the story with uh, Zen, the substitute teacher, is probably the best part about this show. He has actual backstory with uh, with things that happened in his past that affect him as a person. It's almost like he's a real character. Admittedly, because of all the things Hannah has been through, it's definitely easier to get on board with her as the main character. You're kind of just like rooting for her to be okay. They definitely did that well. I will give them that. But overall, this was just kind of boring. Disturbing, but boring. Rightness corroded remaining, regret demolished the story. Let's talk World's Finest Assassin. This show is different, and you can tell by the opening. You may see the opening sequences and be like, wow, this is kind of black and white and low budget, but I see it as an intentional way to separate itself. It's not me in denial. No, but genuinely, I do really like the opening visuals. Uh, Dark Seas Light is another matter entirely. I adore the song. I fucking love it. It's on, been on my on repeat playlist for weeks. But the visuals are what I want to address here. They're just different. Like, right off the bat, you can tell the show is different. A lot of the sequences feel like they don't really line up to things in the actual show. But that being said, the way it sets itself apart, it's so good. It's very visually just imposing. It's it's very good. This is another one of those reincarnated from birth shows. I do think it raises moral questions that I refuse to address. You know, like this dude having 60 something years worth of memories and being reincarnated as a baby. Again, I refuse to address those. There aren't many anime out there nowadays that can take themselves 100% seriously, most of if not all the time, and actually have it pay off. This is one of them. The pacing overall is slow, but very effective in building the world. Again, another really good sense of world building here. 
Everything that Luke does throughout these first 12 episodes feels like it has that purpose of assassinating the hero behind it. It's extra security, or doing what he needs to to establish himself in the world. Everything he does feels like it's towards that goal, right? A lot of problems I have with shows tend to be because there's no, like, single thing you're working towards. There's no end goal. There's just no light at the end of the tunnel. But in, in this, there is totally a light at the end of the tunnel. It's killing a hero. That's the goal. So everything that Luke does, whether it's setting up his cosmetics business, whether it's uh, recruiting Tart and training her in assassination, even rescuing Maha and her friends from sex trading, everything that he does is totally towards that goal. It's it maybe a roundabout way but it is like extra security and it's necessary steps for him to take to get to a point where he could reasonably assassinate the hero because it's not gonna be a walk in the park. It's not gonna be a stroll on a, a Friday night with the dog. It's just not, it's just, it's gonna be fucking hard. I even really like how Lug has character development uh, that he takes from his previous life and goes into his next life with, right? Like. In his first life, he was raised as a tool for assassination, and he's gonna be an assassin in his next life, but he's gonna make the choice to assassinate or not for himself. He's gonna make his own choices to love, hate, that kind of thing. So it's actually quite endearing, however edgy Lube might be. On top of that character development, there's also the the idea of Lube kind of like seeing everyone else as tools, as like pawns in his life that he can use to get what he wants. And I think over time, as it goes on, he's going to kind of learn that people are individuals and he he should treat them as such, right? Like, he's going to get to that point, but he's not there right now. Because, um, I mean, his relationship with Tart could be better. F's in the chat for best girl. Lots of Also, F's in the chat for that one girl who was, who was like, got raped by that fat guy a lot. Lots of Again, if you can get into the world here, the slow pacing probably won't bother you. There's not a lot of action to go with this, but with decent characters and a really solid setting and a good sense of pacing, this show will definitely get you hooked if you can get into it. Just ignore that uh, he fucks his cousin. It's not important. So My Senpai is Annoying is a workplace romantic comedy with shit like Wotakoi leading the charge. They've become a lot more common in recent years, um, but this one definitely has some amount of charm to it. Like, we were already four or five episodes into the full season, and I saw this and I was like, oh, you know, I kind of want to watch this. The show isn't amazing or anything. It's a very subtle charm. You know, the characters do genuinely feel like real people, albeit maybe a little exaggerated. But generally, the interactions are very wholesome and just very sweet to watch. Igarashi is a little hard to get on board with because she's another one of those like girls who just look really young and, and you know tried too hard to be accepted as an adult when they act like a child. And I'm not saying acting like a child is in she's not a functioning member of adult society, but rather she's just like a little insecure and uh, kind of has a hard time being honest. I often find like rom com or like general romance anime kind of hard to watch sometimes. It's a cultural divide thing because in Japanese culture, when you're like very direct and honest, it's considered like very forward and almost like demanding. Um, they just don't speak their minds or even just as directly in general as we do in a lot of Western countries. So a lot of like romance stuff is very, very slow build. And a lot of the characters just are not honest in the slightest, but My Senpai's Inoue actually does a pretty good job of presenting us with scenarios that back the characters into a wall where something has to change, or they have to admit something to themselves, or they have to admit something to their love interest, that kind of thing. Here's what I'll say. If this show was just Igarashi and Takeda, it would be boring. But the addition of Soma and Toko is actually quite nice and balances out the romance aspect in, in a pleasant way. Again, a lot of the charm in this show is very subtle, 
but again, the writing is actually quite clever, and the dialogue is genuine. It's it's nice. Nothing to write home about, but it's nice. So 86 is back. Look, I'm gonna be the first to admit, 86 lost me at like episode seven. It feels like everyone speaks in riddles. Shine Nozen, awesome name by the way, he's a tough nut to crack, but it does feel like everybody speaks in riddles. This show is the epitome of people saying things, but I don't know what she just said. Like they speak words, but it doesn't feel like I digest any of it because they feel like they all speak in riddles. Do they want to die or not? On the bright side, Amazurashi is opening for part two. Incredible. Visuals, awesome for the whole show, but, but, but opening visuals especially, stunning. Amazurashi's song, I forget what it's called, it's awesome. Very fitting for the show. But again, a lot of the animation and visuals overall in 86 have been just gorgeous. Very pretty. I mean, a lot of the visuals are just wee robots jumping around shooting people. <laughs> He's dead. There's definitely substance to 86. If you paid attention, you would probably find themes like discrimination and individual sentiment during times of war in different countries, meanings of life and death, family. But I just wish everyone didn't speak so vaguely. Like even when they have these like heart to heart moments where they're supposed to be really confessing how they feel and they're really emotional, I'm kind of just lost. The voice acting performances have been phenomenal all the way through. But even though he's like shouting and crying, I'm like, did I miss something? Also, because they fucked up uh, and had to delay like three separate weeks, the last two episodes of this are now coming out in March. <sighs> if I have to hear that one more time, Komi K Communicate has been on everyone's radar for a while, and for good reason. I want to start off by saying that I don't think there's anything particularly special about this show, but at the same time, it's incredibly charming. There were points when I was watching where I asked, what the hell is the point of this? Only for there to be no point. But even during those times, it was fun. This show addresses something like a communication disorder in a way that feels very down to earth and very real but still charming. It feels like the goal of the mangaka with this series was to show like that we as human beings with enough support from others and mental fortitude have the ability to overcome something like a communication disorder that comes with like a hefty amount of social anxiety and realize that's kind of all in our heads and we can move beyond it and and gain some amount of confidence and love for ourselves. The most peculiar thing about this show is all the supporting characters have a very specific intention or design to them. They're meant to fulfill a very specific role. That works to this show's benefit for the most part. Uh, Nakai, I'm looking at you. Um, the big sister character I, I really like. Um, the uh, uh, Chuni character is, is quite charming. Um, and Najimi is actually one of the funniest characters uh, in this whole season. Tadano and Komi are incredibly precious. There's something satisfying about seeing Tadano uh, come to learn uh, and be able to tell what Komi wants to say just by her facial expressions. Uh, you know, I mean, for us, it's always the big eyes and cat ears, so we can't really tell the difference, but Tadano always gets it, and there's something satisfying about that. He just, he just gets her, and it's nice. So season two got announced for this at the end of episode 12, and I just saw volume 16 of the manga had come out the other day. Um, that's a lot of volumes. It, I don't think it's too much. I, I, I think they'll be able to keep it interesting. And definitely for season two. But slice of life shows can definitely drag out if they don't change. So hopefully there's some uh, progression. It's, it's very, very charming. Undeniable charm to that show. That's it for this season's roundup. I'll probably be doing this again at the end of winter, which I have about 1.5 times more shows to talk about, probably, on that season. So look forward to that. I'm not. I'll also be trying to make some more 
anime-related ramble videos over the next few months or so. I might try to make it that whenever I don't post a song, I'll post something on here that you guys can fucking sink your teeth into or whatever. We'll see. I don't know. Admittedly, I've rambled about a lot of things that I probably could have talked about on this channel on Firestorm. Uh, Trent knows that one of the guaranteed ways to get me to talk is to t ask me about anime. Um, that, that's guaranteed to get me to ramble. So, I'm going to try to put some more of my rambling on this channel. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you guys uh, will enjoy it. Again, I didn't really script this. I had like some notes that I've looked at. You probably saw me looking at them. Um, I just took a few like bullet points down, and I'll probably be doing that for all the other videos I do on this, because I want to keep them low effort, something I can just do, and then kind of go back and edit later. Um, so I'll try to get this up before the end of the year, and hopefully you guys enjoyed, and hopefully I'll be able to post a couple more videos soon. Uh, and I'll, until then, um, I'll see you guys whenever I do another one. Yeah? I went to the bookstore today and asserted my dominance. I got volumes 4, 5, and 6 of SEO Progressive all at once because I saw they were there at the bookstore the other day and I was like, no one's bought those yet. So I just went and I was like, I picked up all three at once and I was like, time to assert my dominance because I've already got up to volume 3. So I was just like, time to get all the other three all at once and assert my dominance and remove their stock of SEO Progressive. Suck my dick. Christmas money, bitch.